All right, we will go ahead and get started here. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us um, on your lunch break or uh, taking some time out of your afternoon, depending on where everyone is located to uh, join us here for an information session. Um, we're gonna be talking about um, the GIST programs and some information with a former alumni. Uh, but before we begin, this is going to be recorded. So uh, we do send out a recording to everyone who is registered for the presentation. Um, so you will be receiving that shortly after the conclusion. And then um, down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, an option that says Q&A. And um, any questions that you have throughout the presentation, uh, go ahead and type them in there. And we will, um, if, uh, if able, we'll answer it quickly um, via chat with you. Um, but we do have um, a full 20 minutes set aside at the end of the program uh, for questions uh, with uh, all three of the presenters that we have here today. Um, so myself, I am Virginia. I am the enrollment counselor for the online uh, GIS graduate programs that we have here at USC. Um, you've probably heard from me either via phone or email at some point. And then uh, we're joined by Robert Voss, and he is the Director of Graduate Studies and also an Assistant Professor here in the Spatial Sciences Institute. And our featured uh, guest uh, today is Christopher Martyr, and he is a recent alum of our MS in GIST program. Uh, and he is currently a GIS technician uh, with the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority. And so with this, at this point, I'm going to hand this off to Bob. Hi, welcome everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. So um, we will cover briefly USC and the Spatial Science Institute, um, and then a little bit longer, we'll talk about the online graduate program just to give you an overview of what we have here in terms of master's degrees and certificates. Um, and then I, what I really wanna focus on most of the time actually is on what I think makes USC different. We're quite aware, of course, that there are a number of options out there for um, degrees in geography, information science and technology. And um, we think that USC has a number of um, key differences that you should consider. Um, things that, you know, frankly, quite almost make us unique. Uh, and in some cases do make us unique in the world of, of online uh, GIST programs. And so um, we'll talk about some of those things. And then I'm really pleased today to be joined by uh, Christopher Martyr as a guest. And he's a, a recent alum, just earned his degree this May um, from our um, MS GIST program. And so um, I hopefully, I'm, I'm, ho I'm sure he will have some insight for all of you guys about um, choices and um, you know um, thoughts about uh, what he gained from the program and um, and the kinds of things he considered when when he was in your shoes and thinking about the program that he would um, would join. Um, and then finally, we'll have Virginia will be back and we'll have admissions process and next steps just very briefly, and then plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of that. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. So um, USC and the Special Sciences Institute, uh, USC is a leading private university. Um, in spite of our name, people often think we're a public university because of the Southern California, but we are a private university. Um, we'll talk later about what that means um, uh, in terms of the, the difference that makes for our program, but it means you know, generally small class sizes and very regular offerings of our courses. Um, we're also a leading GIS research and academic institution. Um, and so, it means that the opportunity for learning at the cutting edge and um, doing research is present in our program and that may not be true of all programs. Um, we're ranked among the top 25 national universities by US News and World Report. So again, that's the strength of the overall university. And I will talk a little bit later about our faculty. Um, and I think that's of course a big part of, you know, my colleagues who have expertise in a variety of areas are a big part of what makes our program special. Um, so we have a number of memberships and designations just to point out that we're partnered up with a lot of in, in, uh, important and, and leading uh, institutions. Um, so we're a founding member of Unigis International Association, um, which gives us connections in Europe um, and is uh, particularly connects us to the, the global perspective of GIS education. Um, and, and there are a lot of European partners there um, that we have connections with. We're also a member of the Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. Um, and um, 
we're accredited for our geospatial intelligence work with them. We're uh, uh, an educational institution member of URISA, which is the largest organization in the United States of GIS professionals. Um, uh, works to, to work to develop the professional certification the just certification has meetings around the country um, is very much involved in the development of of the just industry in the united states um, and then of course esri is uh, a partner of ours in the sense that we are an esri development center um, and uh, they are obviously the, the the major provider of gis software in the world um, and uh, we generally were an Esri shop, um, especially in our in our master's degree programs. Um, the software, most of the software applications we use are uh, rooted in the Esri ecosystem. So um, let me just give you a, a very brief overview of our um, online graduate programs. We'll just look at each one for a minute here. Um, we have these two master's degrees, a master's in geographic information science and technology, a master's of science in human security and geospatial intelligence. And then we have um, four certificates that uh, students can choose from. We have a graduate certificate in GIST, uh, which is kind of our, our, our big generic um, overview certificate. Um, and then we have a graduate certificate in geospatial intelligence. So it has that, that flavor. There's a, a required course in there um, in geospatial intelligence. A graduate certificate in geospatial leadership. Um, uh, this certificate is really designed for those who are uh, probably more along mid-career and looking to develop and, and move up in the leadership ranks in GIS. Um, and so the electives there are designed around that, uh, that uh, target. And then we have just starting new here, a graduate certificate in remote sensing for earth observation. And so um, we've developed a new remote sensing class and leveraged uh, some faculty expertise in, in, in this area, and we're really excited about this uh, new offering. Uh, so let's just take a look at the curriculum here for a second. So the MS in GIST, or Geographic Information Science and Technology, is um, uh, built around a curriculum where students plan and execute a series of GIS uh, projects at the end of each of their courses. Um, there's a set of uh, uh, three required classes, um, which total up to 12 units. Um, and then there's um, the thesis on top of that, which is two units taken in two semester sequence. Um, and then you can choose among three elective classes for, for 12 units. Um, and sort of different, you can kind of choose different emphases for your elective courses depending on um, your interests and um, and we're, we're continually developing new electives actually as the field moves forward. So we'll be announcing some exciting new elective classes in the next, uh, in the next year or so. Uh, we have the next slide, please. And so we also have an MS in Human Security and Geospatial Intelligence. You'll notice this is a, a little bit a higher unit count. There's a few more courses in this degree. Um, and those courses are related to the kinds of expertise that we want you to have um, not only uh, related to geospatial intelligence, but also related to human security and the kinds of ways that um, chaos kind of can occur in the world, right? Whether it's natural disasters or refugee issues, um, you know, uh, whether the military is directly involved or only indirectly involved in, in humanitarian relief and those kinds of, um, uh, of activities. Um, so we want you to have some, some domain knowledge and then of course the GIS knowledge um, and this, this program, rather than a thesis, this concludes with a, a capstone course, which is a, a collaborative uh, research experience um, uh, with, um, partner, with industry partners, um, rather than a thesis. Um, so a little slightly, slightly different kind of cast to the curriculum there. Next slide. So then, as I mentioned, we have the graduate certificate in GIST. This can be completed very quickly. It's 16 units. It's basically the three required classes from our GIST MS degree, and then one elective of your choosing. Complete flexibility with respect to the elective here. Um, and, um, you know, I think um, the nice thing about this degree is it, it ladders real nicely into the MS and GIST if you decide to do that. And if you don't decide to do that, lots of folks take this degree and they have a lot of knowledge about the principles of GIS and some experience with the technology and they can go ahead and apply those in a wide variety of domains. So very, very useful certificate. Next slide, please. 
and then the graduate certificate in geospatial intelligence. Again, 16 credit hours. Um, here, there's um, uh, uh, one elect, only one elective course because of kind of the, the way that the certificate is structured. Um, there's this uh, specialized course in geospatial intelligence that we call a capstone in this case. Um, and then there's um, two of our, of, our, uh, of our required courses from our GIST MS on this one. And then our graduate certificate in geospatial leadership. Again, this would be for folks who are probably mid-career, um, really thinking about applications of GIS, new applications of GIS, opportunities to be entrepreneurial, start a, a, a business that leverages the technology, um, how to ascend in an organization in leveraging the technology. And so um, here uh, we're, we're focused on Project man our project management course, a specialized course in geospatial leadership, which really is about leadership skills, um, and actually involves also some networking um, at a professional conference, um, and then uh, and, and that's really that the focus of that of that what we call the capstone course in this. The certificate also offers a chance through its electives to choose you know uh, an area maybe of emerging technology where you're not so familiar from earlier in your career um, and you want to get up to speed in, in, a, in a particular uh, area, whether that's web or mobile or something like that. Again, quite a lot of flexibility for the electives. The one elective course that's part of that. Um, and then uh, there's the graduate certificate in remote sensing for earth observation. Um, and so this is an um, exciting opportunity then to have um, two core classes, one which would be our, in the event that you came into this without the GIST experience, you'd have our, our core GIST course on um, concepts for spatial thinking, and then you'd have a remote sensing class. Um, those would be your two courses, and then you could select among uh, a, a, a large array of your electives uh, classes that are offered in our program. So it gives you a little bit of the flavor of our programs and you can see that there's um, you know the right probably the right niche for many different people depending on what their career goals are and um, that's a conversation that um, you could have with Virginia or even with me a little bit as um, as you think about programs what I want to talk about now really is the you know the difference that USC makes um, you know what I think makes USC's programs unique among the universe of just programs that are out there so we'll work through these things, but we take a very active approach to online learning. This is a, not a sit there and listen to lectures, sit there and listen to recordings approach at all. Um, we'll talk about that on a slide here in a second. We have very extensive um, software resources that we deliver through a server, cloud-based server, so that you can really do the work from anywhere and we don't put a burden on you in terms of, of your computer equipment. Um, we have an extensive faculty and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, we're in the context of a research one university which makes a big difference for research um, and then um, lastly we as you can see in the photo here on the lower right um, we have one of our courses that's on Catalina Island and it's available in all of the um, it's required in several of the programs I just reviewed with you and actually available in all of them as an um, or almost all of them as an elective um, so we'll talk a little bit about that um, and then our master's thesis we're the only uh, program in the country that has a required master's thesis. I think that's something that we should talk about in terms of uh, in the way, way in which I think that raises our game and also raises our, the game for our students. Um, and then lastly, um, staying connected and where we are in the country. I think we, we get out quite a lot. Um, we provide a lot of opportunities for networking um, nationwide that I think is important to highlight. So if we go on for an active approach to online learning. So we have no lectures to sit through. Uh, we learn through engaging uh, with materials and exercises that we put out on our Blackboard system. It's an online learning system. Um, we have um, tutorials, we have data prepared for you um, of our, our own devising. Um, uh, it does, of course, parallel some textbooks we use at different points, but we have our own materials that we've developed that we think are, are really um, great for getting your chops up very quickly um, with practical exercises, mostly using ArcGIS Pro. Um, we try to do everything in Pro at this point that can be done in Pro. That's the way the world's moving, and we we started with Pro pretty much as soon as it, as soon as it was on the market about two years ago, two three years ago. Um, 
we do have some written assignments to analyze and apply the concepts and theories learned from reading. So uh, we are not uh, going to primarily focus on teaching you how to use a software. That's part of what we do. But we're actually much more interested in teaching you knowledge that we think is going to benefit you further down the road in your career about spatial thinking, about how the tools are applied, about the way that the statistics are calculated. Um, we want you to really understand when you're pushing buttons in software, what kinds of questions you can get answers to, how those questions have uncertainty or limits to them, um, and, and, and really have an understanding of what you're doing. And so we think that requires some theory and some concepts that are delivered in readings and then with some writing assignments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, as a private university, we, um, we keep our class sizes quite small. Our classes are capped at 20 students. This allows plenty of personal attention. Um, it's quite often the case that we're running especially advanced electives with, um, you know, five to 10 students. Um, so professors will be available to you in office hours for online meetings. You can see here in these images, these are, um, you know, real images of, of online meetings that have happened with our uh, faculty that we just took screenshots of, especially over here on the, on the far right of the slide. Um, so all of our classes have um, at least one time per semester where you will meet live online with your faculty member, but most students um, engage with their faculty members uh, even more regularly than that. And of course, the faculty are each week uh, reviewing your, uh, the you know, work you've done with making maps and giving you feedback on that and kind of the way you're using RGS Pro. And they're also reviewing your writing assignments um, and kind of online, dis online discussions that we have. Um, so, um, their, the voice of the instructor is there um, whenever you're engaging with the course material. Um, you, can, you, can, you can get the instructor's voice, get the voice of other students in the online discussions, and then of course with online meetings. Um, so um, it's, it's uh, really driven by you. You take the materials, you go with them, um, but the faculty is, is absolutely there for support and the other students as well, I think we found in the program. Next slide. So as I mentioned, um, we deliver our software through a, a, a virtual machine that runs on a cloud. And so basically all you need is a desktop or laptop computer with a decent sized monitor and a good internet connection. And the internet connection is important. I would invest in, in that side of things um, so that your directions to the server get there quicker and what the server sending back to you gets back to you faster. Um, but it works uh, quite well. We run um, ArcGIS Desktop, ArcGIS Pro, um, Clark Labs, Terraset, Constellation, Trimble eCognition, um, whatever kind of software we need. We're, every year we're reviewing our, um, our, the software that we have available on our server um, and we're updating it as, um, you know, as needs arise and as people's research is carrying them in certain directions or if we're updating a class to keep it more current with the field. Um, so um, you can see a complete list on our website of the software we offer right now, and we, we, you know, we continue to look at that. Next slide. So this is a, a big one. This is a really important one about you know, who's teaching in our program. Um, and I would like to take a minute and highlight just a few of our senior faculty who you can see, uh, two of them you can see right in the middle center here. Uh, one is uh, Steve Fleming, uh, who uh, was for many years a professor at West Point. Um, and also had a distinguished military career. Um, and um, he's our specialist in human security and geospatial intelligence, um, and does, uh, um, sort of guides our remote sensing curriculum as well. Um, a very important person in the field um, and uh, just a, a great leader on curriculum um, at um, Spatial Science Institute. Then just to the right of him is Karen Kemp, who uh, was Associate Director of the National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis. She's the current president of um, U University Consortium on GIS, UCGIS, the, the group in the United States that really leads on GIS research and education across universities. Um, and she's been a major figure for years in GIS education. And um, she really, uh, again, has been an important leader on our curriculum, um, is going to be moving into an emeritus status um, next year. Um, and then John Wilson, uh, down here next to me, uh, just to the right of me, uh, certainly must mention him. He's our uh, director of the Spatial Science Institute. Um, he's the current editor of the revision for the GIST body of knowledge. 
Um, he's an international expert on digital terrain um, modeling and a fellow with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And he's also obviously a major figure in the field. Um, and so um, and the nice thing I will point out is that it's not every school that has the people at the top ranks like that um, teaching in their online programs, but he does teach regularly in our online program. He teaches uh, two courses each summer. And so he's very connected to what's happening with our online program. Um, and he's been instrumental, of course, also in shaping our curriculum. So the, the geospatial leadership certificate is uh, really his brainchild. It's the only certificate like that in the country. Um, and um, uh, has just been an important leader. And you can see then also the rest of the faculty here, there's a lot of diversity, um, expertise in uh, remote sensing and geospatial intelligence um, from um, uh, uh, these different folks. There's even one person here who I'll point out. Um, uh, she's just above John Wilson in the red dress here. And um, this is a, this is a, a writing instructor that we have um, who has part of her appointment with the Spatial Sciences Institute um, to help our students work on their writing. One thing we found in pursuing our thesis is that it's very important that students um, have good instruction in writing throughout our program um, and certainly on the thesis. Um, it's a major, being able to write well and articulate your ideas is a really important um, professional skill. And uh, we have the benefit of having the writing program at USC and have, be able to have an expert instructor who can really work with writing. So again, that's something I think that I, I imagine in talking to my colleagues around the country is unique about USC, that we actually have a writing, um, professional writing instructor, PhD in English, um, devoted to supporting our students. Um, so she's an additional instructor in some of our classes to review assignments and work with you. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that we have this context of being a research one university. Um, that's important to emphasize because we have very high research activity at USC. So in addition to the faculty that I just showed you on that slide, we have 23 affiliated faculty from schools and departments ranging across history, sociology, public health, planning, and engineering. So these faculty are affiliated with us because they're interested in how their research can grow when it's combined with spatial thinking and um, the, the tools and development of tools that we can do, of software tools that we can do in our interdisciplinary institute. Um, so it's great. These folks are available for us to consult with depending on your interests. Um, they do serve on master's thesis committees um, from time to time, and they're just instrumental in keeping us on the cutting edge um, with our research. Um, so um, the other thing I point out is that our online courses serve students from USC schools and a variety of other majors and programs. So you will have a chance in your online courses to get to meet students from planning and from, um, you know, from urban planning, from engineering, from uh, public health, um, preventive medicine, these kinds of, of, of other programs. And so um, it's a, it should be, make for a very diverse and interesting um, um, online classroom setting. Next slide. And this is something that is absolutely unique to our um, program. We, we have a, USC has a laboratory and facility on Catalina Island, which is just off the coast, 20 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, we have a course out there, which is our, our Fieldworks and Data Acquisition course, um, SSC 587, where we teach you that course online, um, but then you come out for one week during that semester. You've traveled to Los Angeles, you got to Catalina Island, um, and we, we work on field techniques. So we work on, you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, on um, using the latest um, field collection technology. Um, we have data sets that have been developed on Catalina Island over the years. And so what we can see on the next slide here is that we then have group projects where um, we leverage the data that's already been developed. You gather some additional data um, and then you, you work rapidly during that week um, to develop a, a project and complete a project with uh, other students in the class. Um, and the focus of the class really is on understanding the implications of data quality. And so you can see like on this poster here, you know, where they're, they're really considering, you know, what is the UAS orthomosaic imagery add to quality? What was the workflow to gather that? Um, uh, how does it compare to, you know, a, um, existing data sources and so on. Um, and so it's a, a very dynamic class. 
we house you on the island for the week. Um, we do food and stuff like that. It's at a very a reasonable rate because it's a USC facility. So it's um, uh, all sort of included. We obviously we handle boat transportation back and forth and the whole thing is set up um, very, uh, you know, uh, very carefully. Uh, next slide. One of the special things about the Catalina Island experience ties into something else that's unique about USC's program. As I mentioned, we're the only program in the country that requires a master's thesis. And what we found is that um, in order to have success with completing the thesis and getting that thesis done um, on um, uh, time, we need to begin to develop ideas with you about thesis projects from the very beginning of your program. So those students who are in the MS and GIST program start developing their thesis projects at a thesis night workshop um, while they're on Catalina Island. And then that turns into these assignments that are shown at the bottom of that there. Um, so that by the end of 587, you've written what we call a topic prospectus. The topic prospectus is basically an early indication of what you want to do for your thesis. You may not stay with that, you may change topics, but it's really great to have something in writing and to go through that process once and learn you know, what the pitfalls were, right? So that the next, if you develop a new topic, which some students do, then you'll have a much better idea how to develop a topic and how to write about it, right? And then students in other programs have a final project in um, 587 course where they're um, working on um, really examining data quality in uh, a, a great deal of detail. And students who are in a program or in a certificate where they might think that they could become a GIST MS student, particularly those like in the GIST certificate, are welcome to also write a prospectus and to, you know, um, embark on that, um, you know, um, path uh, so they get some feedback on that. Okay, next slide. And then lastly, just to point out, um, uh, this is about the master's thesis or the collaborative capstone. So as I mentioned, we're the only a program in the U.S. that requires a thesis. We've developed, as you can see on the previous slide, a very strong, unique structure to prepare and help students execute the thesis across the whole of the program. Um, many thesis projects um, help students land jobs. I've had many students who've told me, you know, when I was able to go in and give a talk about my thesis, either in an interview or even in a um, you know, like a, 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 a situation where they were giving a trial talk at an employer. Um, it, was the, it was the thing that really helped them land their job. It becomes sort of a calling card for you about the level of professional skill that you bring, about your ability to write and communicate about the application of GIST in the world, right? Um, we've also had students who have won awards. And so in 2018, Kelly Wright won the Jacques, the Jacques May Thesis Prize in Health Geography but from the AAG, which is a, a major prize. Um, it's just she did this fantastic thesis where she mapped existing research on a neglected tropical disease called cryptogiasis. Um, and um, she was a, a winner of a major national prize. Samuel Kruger back in 2012 um, won two prizes for his thesis, the Unigis Academic Excellence Award, so that international award from Unigis, and then the North American Regional Science Competition. I um, wrote a very interesting thesis about um, whether there's a center to Los Angeles. And, and many people have argued for years there is no center, but Samuel Kruger um, did some analysis and believes he found a center, and <laughs> it's fairly persuasive. Um, so, uh, it's, the thesis has been great for our program, as you can see for years, we've had students doing well and, and, and winning awards with it. Um, and uh, um, we really believe in that process and really believe that it identifies you as a, um, you know, as an expert practitioner when you leave our program um, and, and that demonstrates that. We also have in the human security and geospatial intelligence, sorry, one more minute there. Um, we have the uh, capstone, which is a collaborative project. Um, and so in that case, in that degree, you're not doing the thesis, but we do have government partners and industry partners, um, particularly in the aerospace industry in Southern California, and we're doing real world projects with, um, well, with these partners. Um, and so um, that's a really strong um, finish to the HSGI degree, which of course has, has you know, even more coursework in it than the GIST degree. And so we just decided that that was the way the way to conclude that degree was really with um, leveraging collaboration with the industry partners that we have in our research USC. Sorry, next slide. Okay, and so just to say lastly that one thing that's special I think about USC is that we are at 
uh, many places during the year. Um, this is a summary of where we'll be in the next year. And so um, you're welcome to come visit us if you're at the Ezra User Conference, you wanna drop by, we'll have a table there. Um, we'll be at the Fed Ezra User Conference. We have our own geospatial summit that we organize at USC, we're the host of it, uh, which includes industry partners from throughout Southern California. Um, and even other places in California, and people travel even nationally for that now. Um, so it's, a, it's just a fantastic event. And so if you're nearby any of these, um, as a student, we certainly encourage you to come and, um, and get all the information to you about discounts and the various ways that we can involve you. Um, we'll be at the AAG meeting each year. So in 2020, we'll be in Denver, Colorado. Um, we have a huge contingent of faculty that attend that. Um, and then the USGIF Geoint Symposium uh, we're also at each year. Um, so uh, I wanna take about um, 10 minutes here now for a, a talk with Christopher Martyr, um, who's uh, an alum of our um, um, MS GIST program, as I pointed out, just earned his degree in spring of 2019. He's currently a GIS technician with San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, won the first prize in our internal thesis prize competition. Uh, this spring and has a uh, came into a program with a BA in anthropology from Northern Arizona University. So here's Chris ready to join us. So hello there. <laughs> thanks, Chris. Um, I I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about when you joined the USC GIST program. Had you worked professionally with GIS before that? I had not. So I was very first introduced to GIS in my undergraduate experience, and that was back when I was considering doing a cartography minor with my anthropology degree. And at the time, I ended up moving away from it, but GIS was always really intriguing to me, so I kind of kept it in the back of my head. After I graduated, though, I ended up doing kind of an early career with various social service -y kind of agencies. I worked in behavioral health. I worked um, in community development. I even had a stint with Red Cross doing disaster preparedness and even in emergency management. And throughout all of those particular experiences, I ended up realizing that I was doing mapping in one form or another, whether or not I was using Google Maps or just doing even a hand-drawn map to do things like community outreach in a, in a neighborhood or to design a community garden to see um, what the particular scales were. And so throughout that early career, I had not touched GIS, at least in terms of a professional um, ESRI-based product or the leader um, in that field, ESRI-based product. I hadn't touched that stuff, but the concept behind taking layers of information, taking data from various types of um, community sensors, so to speak, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, was able and layer that in a way to drive decision making or at least able to drive away in terms of how do you look at a community problem was really fascinating to me. And so I was definitely intimidated by the fact that when I had applied, I had listed, well, I had done all this other kind of mapping, but I definitely haven't touched a GIS professional product since I, my undergraduate program. Um, but no, I had not touched it. And um, I, I ended up um, realizing that I, maybe that was somewhat to my advantage. Um, because I was able to come in with a pretty fresh, clean slate in terms of being able to adapt and learn a, a brand new software that I didn't have a ton of confidence with. Um, but I picked up, I realized I picked up pretty quickly. Thanks, Chris. Yes. Can you, I, I know that you were promoted to your JS technician position there at San Diego County after an internship. That, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how your career grew when you were a student in USC's program and yeah, so I would def one of the things that I wanted to leverage when I was a student was the fact that I was a student, right? <laughs> the fact that when you are an intern, um, when you have that student status, you have a, a wider range of other opportunities that are available to you. And one of those is internships. And I realized that especially for someone like me coming from a different kind of earlier career, especially with, with a degree in, in social science, such as anthropology, um, I really wanted to go hand in hand with having um, both the education aspect and the in, in the field and production environment aspect both at the same time. So that way the two can end up complementing each other. And so I ended up finding an internship um, with the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority, which focuses on regional transportation planning throughout San Bernardino County, California, if you're familiar with that for those who are out there. Um, and uh, that internship was 20 hours a week that was paid, so it was great. The uh, hours were very flexible. My administrator, um, she was fantastic in letting me go off to do my projects and do my presentations and then come back and finish out my work. 
And after uh, a year of doing that, because I started that at about, after about, oh, excuse me, after a year and a half, because I started two, after two semesters in um, to my program, um, I was then promoted to a GIS techni technician position. And then I'm actually hoping uh, possibly within the next month or so even be promoted to a GIS analyst position, which would end up being full-time work. Um, so the USC experience or the USC uh, schooling very much set me up, I felt, in a positive direction because not while I was able to learn the ArcGIS aspects and the ESRI and the spatial science aspects and what I would consider a fail-safe environment, I was able to take those experiences and apply them directly in a production environment. And then when I would make mistakes there, and I totally <laughs> did make mistakes, um, I was able to articulate to my administrator not only what I did wrong and how I was going to fix it, but then able to give a timeline and, um, and even a corrective course of action in terms of, well, how am I not going to be able to repeat this again? So those are the two things that I definitely think that being a professional, not a professional student, but being a student um, and doing an internship at the same time really allowed me to mature more quickly as a, as a professional in that sense. Great. Thanks, Chris. What are your career aspirations going forward and what role do you think your MS GIST degree might play in, in those? Yeah, so my, my end game professional, there were kind of two end games for me. One is after graduating with um, my bachelor's degree, uh, my uh, catalog with that degree ended up changing. So I ended up not walking away with either a professional um, undergraduate thesis or even really any sort of technical skills from a lab experience. And so that was ended up being a bit of a frustrating thing because as I graduated also right at the start of the recession in 2008, um, technical skills that I had to go to employers were pretty lacking. I was still able to, to, to do what I needed to do and I don't regret those experiences. But when I realized that I needed to get a master's degree, I definitely wanted a, um, some technical expertise. So that was the one aspect. The other is that taking those previous experiences in my very social science -y, uh, work I want to still be able to uh, take those experiences, but apply them in a different way. And so what I hope to take with my thesis um, and hope to take for my graduation, my program in general, um, is a career that melds GIS with legislative and public policy aspects. And having my early career starting out in government, in addition to being able to present data in geographically uh, spatial ways, I'm hoping that that will all can kind of congeal together um, so that I can hopefully influence policy using a spatial science perspective. That's great. It sounds like your, you know, like the conceptual understanding you got in the program and your thesis really plays a role here. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with your thesis and how that might play a role in your future? Yeah, so my thesis, um, what I considered what was fringy, but as you will get in if you, when you get into the program, um, is that, you know, spatial science has a lot of unique aspects in terms of anything that exists within a geographic plane or, in a, or within a spatial orientation, it's fair game to map. And so I was looking at how when people submit public comments as part of a policy revision process for say a land use issue, how when people articulated how a landscape affects them personally through what's called landscape values, how reflecting on those values in more spatially precise terms than not can potentially influence how people, how public policy, um, decision makers look at those and take those comments into consideration when they go to revise their policy. And so I hope to take that particular experience and use those perspectives going to my group, the people that I interact here at my government position and say, hey, this is how people interface with their geographies. This is what you should consider when gathering public comments. This is what you could probably discard. This is kind of the expectations that you set out when you go about doing public policy and those policies have a far reaching, um, far reaching effect across the landscape. And so, yeah, I was definitely concerned when I finished the thesis, like, am I ever gonna end up using this again? But I, I feel actually really confident that that will end up being the case, that I will end up using that. Thanks, Chris, yeah. It's very interesting to hear how that, you know, it seems like a really specific topic, but then it, it really does cut in with your interest in working in public policy and being able to understand how mapping can contribute there, right? It's, it's yeah, oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with the Trojan family and uh, connections with alumni that you may have had, or um, has, has that been a part of your experience now that, you're, now that you're an alum? I know it hasn't been long that you've been an alum, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not long, but it is interesting. Um, Again, in reference to my undergraduate experience, you know, I, I went to an out-of-state, I'm in California, was in Arizona, Northern Arizona University, 
And um, it's a great school, but there's not a, a ton of connection there, at least the way that I could feel it. Um, but now being part of the Trojan family, it's something that you, that you definitely recognize, and it's definitely something that people can connect with you on. Um, in fact, the place that I'm at here, that I know for sure there are four or five of us who are USC alums, and one of them is the executive director of this agency. Now, whether or not that'll ultimately play out to my favor in terms of a long-term career here, you know, it, it's always an anyone's gambit, but it's a great um, icebreaker to know when someone asks you, oh, hey, are, did you go to USC? Or were you, you know, I graduated from USC, and they said, oh, so did I. Um, it's almost an instantaneous connection in terms of how people perceive what it is about your work ethic, in terms of what you perceive about the kind of uh, research quality that you're willing to bring to the table, and the kinds of attention to details that you can bring to an organization, because they know, just as they did, that when you went through a USC program, you were put through your paces. And so it's, it's a unique feeling to walk around and go, oh, yeah, I'm a USC grad and I can connect with other people. Um, and, and that's great. I'm still feeling it out. And like you said, I haven't been a USC alum for long, um, but it, you, you definitely feel a strong sense of connection um, with alums and to other people uh, who went through various diff different programs, even if it wasn't spatial science related. Great. And I just wanted, we just have a couple minutes left here, but I, I wanted you to, you know, reflect back, rewind, rewind back to when you made your decision to come to USC. Um, was, you know, uh, why did you choose USC and were the reasons you chose USC in the end validated by what you found when you got here? Or was there something that you would have really wanted to know that, you know, you didn't quite glean from looking at our materials and maybe attending a session like this and that kind of thing. Yeah, I, so at least right off the bat, absolutely, when I look back on what it is that I wanted out of a graduate program, I wanted to learn a technical skill and I wanted to be able to combine my social service, my undergraduate experience to my graduate so that I could mesh that in together into a future career. That has absolutely played out for me um, very much so. Um, for instance, and I know Dr. Voss, you mentioned before about for those who are already career professionals and maybe they need to brush up on an area such as WebGIS. Well, me being new to the, to the industry and learning and taking a course in WebGIS, um, that has ended up positioning me very, very well because by the time I got into my position here, or maybe about a couple of months in as an intern, when they asked me, well, could you do some web applications for this GIS? And I was able to execute that confidently and be able to articulate, oh, hey, we can do these different kinds of adaptations. That was a fantastic, that, that blew them away. And so that has very much given me the confidence to continue on and saying, okay, I ended up choosing the right aspects. I ended up, when I was looking through various different programs, I ended up choosing the right program because A, it gave me the technical skills that I wanted because I could see through the syllabus when I'm combing through, like, yes, you're gonna learn this and that and the other thing. So I was able to get that. And on top of the academic rigor that comes, as Dr. Voss was saying, from the spatial science approach, um, you know, my administrators have even said that anyone can really learn this stuff. I mean, you could put someone here and, and click the buttons and be able to execute a product or execute a map. But it's something different that when you know the underlying concepts regarding how data drives the visualization of information on a map and vice versa, and how you can take those software products and combine them and mesh them into different applications and to solve different kinds of problems, that's really what a good solid master's thesis degree program does. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that on top of it just being online, the fact that it was able to give me that academic rigor that I felt like I just didn't get in my undergraduate program, I'm, I, I look back and I go, absolutely, it was worth hand over foot. Great. Thank you, Chris, very much. So I think now yeah. um, I, I uh, appreciate it was so much great information from you. And, um, and if you could stay for a few minutes to help answer some questions, that would be fantastic. And uh, give it back over to Virginia now just for a couple of logistical things about applications, and then we'll take questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks everyone. That was uh, wonderful to hear firsthand from someone uh, who's gone through the program here. Uh, so we'll go a little bit just about the admissions, student criteria, that type of thing to give you an overview of what to expect with that. Um, as far as the admissions material goes, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we uh, will have you fill out an online application and there's a $90 fee to um, submit that and have it reviewed. And you will upload to that online application official transcripts, um, an up-to-date resume. You'll write a statement of purpose, which is like your admissions essay for the program. 
And then a professional writing sample. And for that, um, we'll, we see things that are professional uh, or academic in nature. So a paper that you've written previously um, in either an undergrad or master's program is acceptable for that as well. Um, if you are applying to a master's degree, you'll submit two letters of recommendation as well as an official GRE score to the, um, to the program, and that's what we'll review. And then coming up here um, are important dates for the fall 2019 semester, which is our next start. Um, we do have a rolling admissions process, so once we get your application documents in, we will review you and have uh, an answer back uh, within two weeks, typically. Um, the deadline to start on August 26th is July 15th. Um, with about a two week grace period after that to get in any, uh, uh, any uh, documents that are still outstanding. Um, so still definitely time to apply and get started with us here in the fall. And with that, we'll go ahead and start the uh, Q&A that um, we have set aside some time for. And the first question um, is, um, Chris, this is probably a great question for you, and it's, uh, could working professionals complete the certificate program? Um, how, uh, you were working while you had started this. I mean, how did you feel like the time management um, went with how flexible the program was structured? Yeah, um, I would say, so at least not in terms of the, the requirements for the certificate program, but I mean, they know they, they mesh one in the same. Um, but I would say that, if you are coming in without any sort of prior JS experience, or if you, um, but you maybe have some inter like interactions with maps, like I, I think part of that question was also real estate development. So you kind of maybe have some basic questions, so you have some basic understanding regarding kind of how maps work and what their, their purpose is and kind of um, those, those aspects to it. Um, I would say that you will probably spend maybe a little bit more than 20, 25, and maybe at its peak, maybe 30 hours. I mean, it kind of really depends on, on you. It depends on um, you know, how thorough it is that you want to be when it comes to learning the material. It depends on how quickly you absorb the material. Um, but I would say overall, given the fact that it is online, except for that Catalina part, of course, which is totally worth, by the way, <laughs> to dedicate a week to go out to, because it's Catalina is gorgeous. If, for those of you who don't know about it, look it up on a map, because it's amazing. Um, but Otherwise, I would say that given the fact that it's online and the fact that professors can interact with you at different times and you can reach them at different hours, um, even outside of office hours, a little bit, um, and you can complete kind of work on your own pace, but the fact that there's deadlines there, I think it's totally doable. Um, and in fact, like I had said before, given the fact that if you want to really be able to hone your skills in terms of taking from the academic learning setting, and moving into your professional setting, I think doing the both at the same time is, is really the benefit. Um, again, you don't really get a whole lot of opportunities to be both a student and a working professional. And I think um, production environments are a little more forgiving in terms of giving you opportunities to try out your new skills. And if you make mistakes, like I said, you can learn from them, pick up and end up moving on. Um, so I absolutely would say that, that it's doable. And from my experience, um, I would even recommend it. I don't know, Dr. Boss, if you have other thoughts to that. No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, um, you know, that you, you we, we have a lot of students who work, um, even some who work full time, and it's just a question of balancing and just to be aware that you have deadlines every week and you meet those deadlines. So, um, and I think in terms of um, real estate development, uh, probably the, the GIST certificate would be the most appropriate. Uh, because it's broad, it, it lets you pull in, um, you know, shape, shape your interests in, in, in that way. Great. Uh, and then we had one come in, pretty straightforward question. Uh, what's the ballpark average for the GRE score of accepted applicants? Um, we will look for um, a score of 300 or above. Uh, that's the combined total score. Uh, but always like to caveat this with that we review all applicants holistically. So all pieces of your application are considered uh, when applying to the program. So if you have specific questions about a score that you've received, definitely uh, give us a call so we can uh, talk a little bit more detailed about your, you know, individual background and how that would play in with your application. And I might add to that to just to say that um, 
you know, I think it's rare that if, a, if an application is really strong in every other respect, that a, rel, a low GRE score would be determinative in declining someone's admission. The GRE score, look, we're an R1 university. We have to have a GRE score on every applicant. <laughs> so if you haven't taken a standardized test in a long time, haven't taken the GRE in a long time, just be brave. Take it, do the best you can, prepare a little bit, do the best you can. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. We, we, you know, we, we understand that, that that test is for many people kind of the skills in there are kind of ancient history and <laughs> high school math and this kind of thing. So um, we're, we're, you know, very, very aware of it, of, 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 of the total application as Virginia was saying. And I can even jump in a little bit myself. Um, I won't reveal what my GRE score was, but um, I was definitely not confident with my GRE score. And it was actually, when I was applying, it was one of my very first questions to the previous recruiter. I'm like, hey, here's kind of where I'm sitting. Um, so what do you think? And the exact same response was given. You know, we look at it from a holistic perspective. We look at not only what you were able to achieve on that, but also your other aspects regarding your professional work and kind of um, what your, I don't know, gumption, I guess, for saying, you know, how, how you want to be able to get into this program and learn those perspectives. Um, and so I ended up getting through this program. I ended up, you know, completing for a thesis prize. So I would say if you feel like your score is not good enough, just go for it anyway. I mean, your application is ultimately, like they said, they're going to review all those aspects. And I, I mean, aside from an application fee, you, you really got nothing else to lose. Chris is too modest. He didn't just compete for the thesis prize he wanted. So we're not, <laughs> we're not going to miss a good applicant because of a low GRE score. <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, this one I will take because it is a pretty common path that we have students um, go, and that is to transition and start as a graduate certificate student and then um, parlay those courses and complete the rest of the master's requirement. Um, the transition is pretty straightforward. It would require you to apply to the master's, and most people do that in the last semester of their certificate. Um, there are no higher costs for doing it this way. There's no additional time, because um, if you just apply to the master's to start um, in the semester that's coming up, um, you wouldn't lose any time, and you'll just kind of keep moving through that program. Um, you will submit updated documents, uh, updated writing sample, obviously a new resume. Um, and at that point you will um, uh, get letters of recommendation. Uh, and we'd like to see at least one, if not both of those from USC faculty that you've taken a class with. And then um, for that uh, portion uh, to apply to the master's, there is um, still a chance that a GRE score is going to be required for admission to the program. Um, but it is a, a conversation if uh, a student's performance is strong enough in the graduate certificate uh, where a possible waiver could come in for them. And then, um, Bob, I think this question would be good for you. Um, it's, it's sort of in your wheelhouse, I believe, about which program that um, we have that would be best suited for someone interested in regional or urban planning as a career. Yeah. Um, I would say the MS GIST program. So we have quite, if you look at our, our library of master's thesis work, you will see quite a few thesis projects that are really in that um, urban and regional planning um, domain. Um, you know, things on smart transportation, smart growth, um, modeling of transportation networks. So we have a lot of folks from the MS GIST program who've gone on for careers in urban and regional planning. They work for SCAG in Southern California. They work for local governments. Um, so I think that's the, the, the place to be. Um, and, then, and then we have tracks within that that uh, you know, will make sense. And, and I would talk with you about what electives you're picking and you, know, you would target the final projects in your classes Given the electives you're picking, you would target them around that, um, around your interests in urban and regional planning. And here's Chris. Chris is working at a, at a regional transportation agency, so he could take that as well. And he's an MS just grad. Yep. And um, I would even add to that, I, I know a couple of other colleagues who they are um, starting, I think one, oh, one just finished a program. 
for, I think the emphasis was urban planning itself, but it had a GIS component. And then uh, someone else that I had a meeting with just yesterday, she will be starting a uh, master's program that will also have a GIS component in there as well. Both of them did not do the USC, so I'm like, well, you'll get what you'll get. No, I'm just kidding. But, but either way, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would totally agree with that, hands down. GIS is a great catch-all to look at urban planning problems from a multitude of different perspectives, whether or not you're going to look at that from using data from like social science stuff or looking at data from like air quality or doing just basic network analysis and in transportation modeling. GIS is definitely a, a good skill, technical skill set to come to the table with. Maybe one other thing to point out about, I think what makes USC unique in that space is that we, we have a partnership with uh, Price School, which has the urban planning department. Um, for our undergrad geodesign major. We're the first undergraduate geodesign major in the country. And so geodesign is this field that brings together urban design and GIS. And so our faculty are really steeped in that. We have ongoing research in that area. So that really is going to support, um, support your work in your, in your courses that you, that you identify. Great, and then we got a couple other questions. Um, one I wanted to touch on is, are there many veterans in the program and how can a veteran improve their application package? Uh, we get quite a few um, current and former military members uh, who apply to the program. Um, we love to have them. Um, a lot of them will come in with uh, at least a, a foundational knowledge of, of what GIS is through uh, what they were doing as part of their military service. Um, in terms of strengthening your application, uh, just the same things that we would tell everyone. We really sort of accept um, students from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, we don't have approved um, majors that qualify you to be admitted to the program, nor do we have a list of specific courses that uh, must be completed before you're eligible to start your master's. Um, so um, along with the other applicants um, and the students that we have in the program, veterans add another component of that diversity that we love to see in terms of um, people's interest in their application and the experiences that they're coming from. Um, well, I've gotten a couple questions about other starts. Uh, and along with the rolling admissions, we do start um, classes in all three semesters. So um, it would be the um, spring, summer, and fall, uh, which would be January, May, and August, respectively, in a general sense um, in terms of starting the program. And then, uh, Bob, this is a good one uh, for you to take, I believe. Um, it's talking about uh, learning approaches and, and doing it more as learning by doing. And so embracing more of a hands-on, less lecture-oriented approach. Uh, it says, so to what extent um, would you say that um, the curriculum is that versus more of a self-study, non-academic professional development program? and how those, uh, how the program would differ from something like a self-study? Well, it, it, it's definitely, okay, so it's a very much a learning by doing sort of situation. We call it a flipped classroom or active learning model. Um, so it's not listening to lectures, okay? So that's, so that's the, that's important to say. But it's different than self-learning, right? In the sense that you have a faculty member that you can have office hours with each week, <clears throat> that you can have emails with, that you can be in touch with for support. You have, um, we, we really try to facilitate in the online learning system, the Blackboard system connections with the other students and maybe Chris can speak to this and how that works in terms of the discussion boards. Um, so there's a lot of support and a lot of structure that the faculty brings to the learning. So, um, you know, there are materials that you can only get by being in our program, um, and there are um, these connections that we, that we facilitate in the way we build, the, build our, our online uh, learning, learning system. Chris, can you talk a little bit about that, maybe about how, just briefly about how you were able to connect with other students? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, and, and I, and I get where the question is coming from, right? Like if, if you can, if all this information is out there, why not just learn it yourself? And, and the problem is, again, yes, you, you, you could. And, you know, my administrator is one of those who's like, yes, you can, you can set someone in front of a GIS and you can learn those topics. You could probably even go out to the library and find some topics on spatial science. But really it's about, it's about taking those applications and those concepts 
and trying them out and articulating them to a group of your peers and to your professors to say, hey, does this make sense? Am I tracking on this right? Am I applying this that thing accurately? Um, and that's really where things like the Blackboard discussions come in handy. And so, um, yes, usually there's some assignments, um, depending upon which particular course, some of them may do a little bit more, may do a little bit less, but ultimately you will be at some point interacting with fellow students through an online chat or this back and forth messaging board system uh, where you can bounce off different ideas and different perspectives. And that's really where not only are you connecting to your other, your other students, but that's really where you end up formulating your ideas when it comes to how spatial science applies to GIS and how GIS applies to spatial science. Um, because at the end of the day, you can retain all of these aspects regarding these different perspectives, but you, we have to be able to apply it and articulate that to an audience who can then kind of not validate, but able to email, engage with you in the conversation about, oh yeah, that makes sense. I haven't thought about it. Like, oh, that I would challenge you on that. So I don't know if that makes if that makes sense or if that answers that. But. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really helpful. Um, and we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. I know there are some questions that we didn't get to, and I will uh, be sure to follow up with uh, those via email after uh, we have everyone's contact information from your registration. So do want to be respectful of everyone's time here, but um, thank you again so much for joining us. It was a really great conversation. Thanks, Christopher, for uh, taking time out of your uh, day to uh, join us and give some insight about your experiences. Uh, my contact info is listed right there. Um, my email, virginia.leonard at usc.edu. Um, the number 213-235-2125 uh, to connect. And then gis.usc.edu is the main webpage for all these online programs. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us and fight on. Great. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.